evening tonight on focusing on uh, growth monitoring. So welcome everybody. I think we're still missing somebody, but when they come, they come. Um, and I think you all know the Zoom protocols. Please keep your cameras turned on and raise your hand if you've got a question. Um, and if somehow I miss it, then shout out. But we'll try to watch for hands as we go through this discussion. Um, we're, we've got really just one big item, uh, which is reviewing the draft. Uh, on our agenda, we have ETAC membership. And Heather, that'll probably just take her about five seconds to deal with. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk about schedule. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. So um, I'll accept a motion to uh, approve the uh, summary minutes of the last meeting. Is, does somebody want to move to accept I'll, I'll I'll this move. is Howard, I'll move. <laughs> okay, either Sue or uh, Howard. I think Sue raised her hand a second, fraction of a second sooner. And you've got your hand raised. Yes, I had my hands raised because I want to bring up one quick topic before we start. Um, I am participating in a lot of other Zoom calls where they have closed captioning. And I know that it's possible to get closed captioning um, so if there's any way that the city could do that for the subsequent meetings, that'd be great. Uh, the nice thing about that is that you get a whole chat column over on the right. So everybody has the benefit of being able to see the captions if they want to. Um, it helps me a lot. Um, I, I do quite well with, um, with the system as it's set up, but I do better if I can have captions. So if there's a way to do that, that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. I think we actually were just talking about that last night. Um, and I think we're renewing our Zoom licenses in the new year and hoping to overhaul and get some better features and stuff like that. So uh, that is the plan. Okay. So Sue uh, moved that we accept the meeting minute summary. And do we have a second? Howard, do you want to second it since you are Mark? Mark seconded first. All right, moved by Sue, seconded by, and everybody in favor of the um, minutes, approving them, raise your hand. Don't seem to be any opposed, so we they carry. Can I get a vote from Phil? What was uh, the question, I'm sorry. Uh, on the, late. yeah, 10, 21 minutes. Right on. Okay, great, thanks. And I, should ask Alina, is there anybody who, um, anybody from the public for public comment? No, no, nobody from the public attending tonight. Okay, so let's move right on with the agenda. So ETAC membership, Heather. Sure, yeah, I just, for those of you that um, are tracking when our membership discussion happens, um, we have been trying to do that around the fall. Um, and we did that staggering of memberships, but we didn't do any for three years because we didn't need to. Um, everyone was staggered, and then we had a core group that had the full four-year term. So um, that's all just to close the loop that, um, that we don't need to do anything. So you're right, Kevin, it was a 30-second agenda item. I don't know why I had five minutes on there. <laughs> all right, unless somebody has questions about it. But All right, so... Big shout out to staff for getting us the draft report. Um, and Heather and Elena, take it away. Great, thank you. So I am gonna go through my awkward sharing of my screen, if you can hold for just a moment. Looks good, Heather. Okay. <laughs> 
So uh, some of you heard that I was saying, I wish I had a party hat on. I am so happy to be able to say that this is the first meeting that we will be reviewing the first ever draft growth monitoring comprehensive report Put all the adjectives around it. Um, very excited. Thank you, Sue. Yay. Um, that's not to say I don't expect edits and concerns and questions and all of that. Um, that is definitely what we're here for. Um, but you all and the TRG before you and staff, um, both planning, um, community development, um, ISD, our Information Services Division, um, have just put a ton of work into um, getting this ready for even being reviewed. So it's very exciting. So that I'm a bit giddy, you guys. Okay. So um, as we go over this topic tonight, there are just a couple of key points I wanted to talk about. And um, some of those were in the memo that we that Elena sent with the report, but just um, as a reminder, because we know we didn't get the report out to you as um, soon as we had liked to, um, or months, months ago, actually, was when we were originally planned, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so go over some of those, do an overview of the report, because I'm guessing some of you have not been able to um, actually look at the executive summary. I mean, what we, we were optimistic, but, um, but we know that you have a bunch of other things going on. So <clears throat> we'll do a little bit of an overview of the report, um, talk about um, at a high level, the executive summary and the recommendations. Um, we're not making any determinations about those right now. Um, and I'll talk about that more in a minute and then go over next steps. I know at the last meeting, we had talked about um, opening up this meeting to go over the employment efficiency measures information, which Elena sent out a couple weeks ago. Um, if you had time to look at that, you probably noted that um, they aren't being used that much yet. And so that in itself is a discussion point, um, but it felt like we have the report. And so, um, since there's not a lot of data to analyze, but maybe more of conclusions to come from that, we felt like we could talk about that um, as when we get into that part of the report rather than trying to talk about that now. Because um, I don't know about you guys, but I've heard some people say they just wanna look, start looking at the report. So, so we heard that and that's, that's kind of why we're planning to just dive in. Um, I also wanted to mention that we, it is possible that we will end early tonight um, because like I said, we, we had hoped to get you the report on Monday, that didn't happen. Um, and so what we could do is if once we get through this and we get through, um, you know, talk all the way through next steps, um, we can talk about, we can end early and give you some time to read the report. Like, um, you know, we want to we want to give you that space. Um, we don't want to hold the meeting just to hold it. So, um, and there's going to be a lot to talk about. Um, so, okay. So, I can help it. I just wanted to <laughs> just wanted to uh, throw that up there. We have to take a moment. Everybody, pat yourselves on the back for all that you've done and. Um, the over 200 pages you're about to relook at. <laughs> um, I know that's a bit daunting, but just as a reminder, you've looked at a lot of this data. Um, so, but I, it's really important to pause and just, um, even if it's over a Zoom, <laughs> a Zoom slide, just to celebrate where we're at. So thank you for your volunteer hours. This is very much a thank you as well. Okay, so it was literally a pause. Now we're going on to <laughs> the meat of it. So if you had time to read the um, memo that went with the report and the appendices, 
Um, the way that we're thinking about it is that um, we're going to review the report and the appendices together because the report really summarizes the appendices. So we're going to kind of walk through both of them um, by topic area. So we might be doing a little bouncing back and forth. Um, the way that we wrote it is we actually wrote from the bottom up, right? So you had to start with all of the data and the appendices to be able to write um, the report itself. And so that's why we think it's important to review them together um, so that all of the data, you understand the data and then how we're summarizing it. Um, you also saw a timeline in the report or in the memo that said, you know, the, how we were going to proceed through the topics. It's basically in the same order that the report and the appendices are in. It's the same order as the topics in there. Um, we don't know how long it's going to take us, right, in each meeting to get through this stuff. Um, there could be a bunch of questions on one topic area and not very much in another topic area. And so I just want you to keep that in mind when you're preparing um, for the meeting, that things could go really fast in one meeting. And we may be starting out in the next meeting talking about household demographics and thinking that we're not going to get to housing development, but we might. And so just um, try to be aware of that possibility. Um, just a couple of reminders or things to think about as far as the um, how we're going to go through this, because it's a lot of information. Um, what we're anticipating is that this would be big picture conversation. Um, there's definitely, you're going to find spelling errors, you're probably going to find some bad grammar. <laughs> um, you know, we tried to go through and do that kind of stuff as much as possible. Um, but we really, I truth be told, we did not focus on that as much. We really focused on getting the data, making sure we were comfortable with the data that was in there. Um, and so just know that and that kind of stuff, um, which I have down here, you can send to us, you know, via track changes, maybe at the end or at some point, uh, you know, whatever works for you. Um, but the meetings should really be kind of more big picture. If there are concerns about the data, if there are concerns about the conclusions, if there are things that we're not tying together that should be that kind of thing. Um, the report and the appendices, um, this is something that I have to remind myself when I want to go, why? Why is that happening? Um, so this is a monitoring report. And so the goal is to say, what did we assume? Or one of the goals, what did we assume? And what has actually happened? In some cases, um, <laughs> We will um, be able to see that um, you will be able to, I don't know if we would say why, but we would be able to um, maybe draw some conclusions about, um, about or pontificate a little bit, like some of the data is telling us this. Um, but, but the report and the appendices are not really a study. Um, but we can use them to flag when further study is needed. And so um, part of that is because of where we are in the monitoring period. We're really, we're only eight years into it, which seems like a lot, but it's not necessarily for some of the data that we have. Um, and so that's just a reminder that if there are areas where um, Areas of concern is what the monitoring report should be, or, or no concern, should be flagging. And if there are areas that we specifically want to call out for more study, which we tried to do in the recommendations, um, let's do that. You know, if there's some of those that we're missing, we should put that in there. Because when we do the next UGB analysis, that's the opportunity for a market study, um, further looking at redevelopment, really kind of digging into stuff that a monitoring report isn't necessarily going to do, but the monitoring report will help inform um, those future studies. Um, as I mentioned before, ETAC, you have reviewed most of the data. 
Um, some, there are some updates. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so the goal now is really the report is pulling all of that together. So are there concerns with any of the conclusions? Are there missing key messages? Um, are there concerns with the overall format and layout? That's something that um, we focused a lot on with the individual charts, but how is the report working? And just know that um, it's definitely going to be reformatted, um, but lightly because um, we don't want to create something that takes a whole bunch of staff time to format and make beautiful. This is a monitoring report. It's not a vision. Um, it, and so there are going to be some, there's a lot of charts, there's going to be some infographics, and there's going to be some formatting, but it's not going to be like the Envision Eugene recommendation or some of those things that are pretty um, graphics heavy. But does the layout, does the order, those kinds of things, do they make sense? Um, and again, we welcome your track changes. Um, feel free to send them to us. You know, I always have to say we may or may not use them, right? And so just don't be offended. Um, and, you know, we'll definitely talk to you if there's something significant that you've suggested. Um, we can talk to you about that. Um, the other thing I wanted to flag is that there are a couple of things that you have requested that we haven't had the, the or suggested we look at and, um, you know, like student housing, pulling out some of the student housing and, um, data and seeing what the data is without student housing, that kind of thing. You know, we haven't had a, we haven't had time to do that. Um, and so there could be some things like that. Um, although that I hope we can get to you before you're done with your review. Um, but there could be some things that come out of your review that um, we want additional data on, we need to clarify whatever that is. Um, and that could happen after you've said yes, you know, we generally support, you know, agree with this, we don't have any additional um, concerns. We do think that these additional things, um, it would be great to have them in here. And so if that happens, we will circle back with you with that data. We won't just bring it to planning commission, but we'll circle back and let you know what, um, what we found. But I did just wanna flag that for you that there could be some changes after it moves forward. Um, and that's why it's labeled as draft. Everything says draft right now, draft, draft, draft. Um, it will be draft through planning commission. I think, um, I'm not sure if we'll take the draft marks off when it goes to city council, or it depends on how many meetings there are with them. But um, I just wanted to kind of flag that for you that that's why it's draft. It's a work. It is a work in progress. Okay. So um, because we didn't think you had enough to look at, we've created two more memos for you to look at. <laughs> Um, we haven't given them to you yet. They will be in the meeting folder tomorrow um, because we're doing our final review on it. But I hope that these are helpful to you as you're going through the report. The first one is a memo that um, talks about either specific charts or specific areas um, that have changed um, since you reviewed the data. So as an example, just at the top, you know, I think you reviewed census data went back when we only had up through 2017. So all the census data um, has been updated to include 2018 and 2019. That's what we have available. Um, so that's new to you. You haven't looked at that yet. It's a couple of years and it's, you know, ACS data. Um, but I do wanna flag that for you, that we have tried to update all of the data with the most recent available data um, by about mid 2021, um, which doesn't mean the data is good through 2021. Um, Cause as you may recall, the most recent Eugene jobs data that we had was 2018. That hasn't changed, that's still what we have. So um, actually, I think when you guys looked at it, it was 2016, and now we've added 2018 data. So that, that's another example. So anyway, we tried to kind of call out some of these things. Um, you, we had a great discussion when we talked about income, about adding 
median um, family income chart. We didn't have time to do that, but we put the data in the report. So just trying to document things that we talked about doing and agreed to do um, through our meetings and whether or not they have happened and if they haven't, why. Um, this example here, this is the first page, it doesn't show, but um, there was some, you know, the questions about student housing, I think there were some other questions. So those will show up on the left-hand side here and where we had the information, we put it in here. Um, and then, but student housing is still coming. So right now it says pending in the document. And so we can update this document as we go. But trying to be fully transparent with you and help you as you go through the document, remember where there's areas that, hey, you know, I, I, we didn't look at this all the last two years of this data. The other one, which I think there was a snapshot of this in the report, um, but this is a table that tries to take the metric and um, has a column for what the adopted assumption is, if it has an asterisk by it. So this is our adopted population growth rate and the people that we assume, the number of people. Um, and then, excuse me, um, if there's other data that wasn't officially adopted, but was data that we used for context at the time of the UGB, so like median family income wasn't, or household income wasn't adopted, but it was context at that time. So, um, so basically this goes through and puts all of that information in here any particular notes, um, mostly data source notes, because there are some changes um, with the data sources. Um, and like, for instance, the employment growth rate, um, you know, we were using the 10 year growth rate from 2012 to 2022 for Lane County and, extra and um, extrapolating that for 20 years. Now we have a new um, growth rate. Again, we only get a 10-year prediction from um, Oregon Employment Department, but we're documenting that here. So it's kind of a cheat sheet, I guess, is the way I think about it. Um, so all of this information is in the report. It's just um, kind of a handy way to, if there's something you want to look at, but you don't want to dig through the appendices, you can check on this. And there will be two versions of this. Um, one will be just the key data, and then that will be in an appendix in the report itself. And then there will be the full one, um, which will be in the appendices. So we'll get the full one out to you um, in the report, hopefully, to, or in the folder, hopefully tomorrow. Okay, so the structure of the report um, and the appendices, I think I talked about this before, but given how much there is, I'm just gonna go over it again, is um, this onion, the way I think of it, is an onion concept. So the executive summary is up front and it is the elevator speech if you're stuck in the elevator for a while, but um, it is an elevator speech. It kind of hits the high notes for each of our topic areas. And the topic areas are, again, in the same order that they are throughout the whole report and the appendices. Um, there are recommendations. And so <clears throat> the recommendations are um, somewhat high level, um, which you will see. And we can, like I said before, we can add to those um, where we need to. Um, there are key statements that are bulleted or um, bolded in the executive summary. Um, so that's kind of the outer onion. And then you get to the snapshots. The snapshot sections are, they have key questions that we're trying to answer for each topic area. And then there is just a little bit more detail. Um, so that's when you start seeing one or two infographics or one or two charts um, regarding, for instance, population. 
and population goes from a paragraph in the executive summary to four paragraphs in the snapshot. Um, then when you get to the appendix, um, population has its own section and that's where you're gonna see all of those charts that we have been sending you. And when we explain those charts, when we're talking about those charts and what our findings are and what the data sources are and all that, that's all in the appendix. Um, and mostly what we were reading to you when we were presenting those charts to you. So that's the like inner onion, <laughs> that is the detail. And um, we tried to put in, you know, uh, if you want more detail in the executive summary about population, if you want more detail, see this part of the snapshot and this appendix. So we tried to put in some breadcrumbs um, but that's another ex good example of letting us know if those breadcrumbs are not working. I'm using a lot of food analogies, but um, we also know that some folks are not going to want the appendix. They're not going to want to get into the appendix, right? And so um, there are a couple of things that are um, repeated in both documents. So the glossary is in both of them so that so that the report can stand alone um, from the appendix. And then, like I mentioned, the, um, the assumptions table will be a truncated version is the way we're thinking about it now, but the key assumptions table will be in the report and then the full table will be an appendix. So I thought at this point, it would make sense to um, walk through at a high level, the executive summary and the recommendations. Um, as a reminder, we are not finalizing these right now. I'm not even ex really expecting any comments, but we can definitely talk about it. Um, I just thought it was important to start with that, even though, like I said, we wrote the report from the bottom up, um, so that you have in the back of your mind what conclusions we are drawing as you're reading um, the snapshots and looking at the charts and the appendices, um, so that you don't have to try to draw your own conclusions, but um, we've got some there for you to react to. And so we will revisit the executive summary for each topic um, as we go through the report. And if there are some areas where we're like, well, you know, the executive summary about population, or maybe population is not a good example, housing efficiency measures, that topic, I really need to look at some other section first that we haven't gotten to yet, that's fine. You know, we can, we can re revisit the executive summaries at any point. Um, but I do like the idea of kind of doing things, um, doing all the topic related pieces together. So if that is okay with everyone, I'd like to just walk through um, the executive summary at a high level. Any concerns? When, yeah. So you'll you'll sort of uh, announce when you'd like to uh, handle questions or comments. Okay. Yeah. I mean, are there any questions or concerns right now before we walk through the executive summary? Don't see any hands. Okay. Good. Okay. So. Um, I am going to see if I can make this happen. Not looking amazing in my PDF here. Hold on just a sec. Yeah. 
Hmm. Okay, and we're gonna have to do it. I was really crafty. I could actually read what's on Elena's screen, a reflection of your glasses. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, are you were you looking for the word doc the etech word version Heather I was trying to share the pdf there can you guys see that okay. yes. yeah okay good okay um yeah I think it's a little, it's, it will be easier um so as you'll note um there are a bunch of comments on the side uh those are those are because um, there are some things that we called out that we would like to make sure that um, if anyone has particular comments on them, that we address them. Um, and also things like this, where I said, you know, we're double checking this number. Um, it's not crucial to getting the report in front of you, um, but wanted to make sure you knew that we were still looking at it. Oh boy. Does not like sharing the PDF version. Interesting. I wonder if it's because it's got too many. I'll tell you what, Elena and I have been through some challenges with this document. Um, so I'm just gonna pull it up from the website. Maybe the word doc? Maybe, yeah. Let's see. You guys see that monitoring report? Yeah, okay. Okay, is that big enough for you guys? Can you make it bigger? A little bigger. That's better. Too much? No, that's good. good. Okay. Okay. All right. So hopefully the order makes sense about the topics. We basically started with like overarching population, employment growth, and then demographics, and then development. And then at the very end, um, we talk about the BLI rerun that they um, coordinated, did, ran, did all things, and that we all reviewed um, back at the beginning of the year and early end of last year. Um, and then putting that together with um, the demand if we were to start UGB planning today. What is the current PSU population forecast and what's the current OED forecast for employment and you know moving that forward. So pretty high level, there's way more analysis that needs to be done, but it just gives us an idea a snapshot of where we are at. So for population, um, we have added over 15,000 people over the monitoring period. We're planning for about 34,000 people. So almost half. Um, we're not halfway through the monitoring period yet, but we've added almost half. And so it makes sense that we've seen a growth rate of 1.2%, which is more than the forecasted rate. And so this is a good example of, but we're in the middle of the monitoring period and the forecasted rate is for 20 years, right? And so we could be growing faster now and slower moving forward. We could be growing faster moving forward. We don't know. Um, we have incorporated PSU's latest population forecast as a comparison, and they're actually projecting for the next 20 years, 2020 to 2040, that we would still grow at 0.9%. So actually it's not a change um, from what our adopted forecast is. But then after 2040 through 2070, it slows down to 0.5%. 
Um, we get this question. This is a hard one. So if anyone has any um, has good data, that's the hard one on this one, but good data. Um, who's moving here? <laughs> and who's leaving? Why are they leaving? Why are people moving here? Why are they leaving? Those are great questions. They are so hard to answer, um, especially not in just a, um, what's the word I want to use? Not qualitative, but not conjecture, but like, um, what's the word? Um, data yeah. driven. Yeah, we want it to be data driven, but it's kind of like, oh, anecdotal, right? So we hear anecdotally that people might be leaving because of housing costs are expensive here, or if we don't have jobs or, you know, things like that. But what is the data saying? And so um, we did look at IRS data. Um, it doesn't give us a ton of information, but it does tell us that um, Lane County has experienced the most in-migration is from out-of-state residents compared to in-migration from other Oregonians. So that's interesting and that's been pretty consistent. Um, that's new data. Actually, I need to add that to the memo. That's new data. You guys haven't seen that, um, but um, we fleshed that out more in the appendix. Um, it turns out it's been that way back to 2000. Um, and then if you look at it by state, um, in migration from out of state um, is overwhelmingly from California which is another one that we hear anecdotally, right? Um, but that is true. <laughs> um, and then the most immigration from elsewhere in Oregon by county was from Multnomah County, um, which is interesting. Uh, another piece that's interesting is that incomes of those migrating to into Lane County from out of state were 93% higher than those migrating to Lane County from elsewhere in the state. So that's about, the, the level of information we could get about other than demographic information, which is usually at the, is also usually at the county level. Um, this was the, the other data-driven um, information we could find. And again, remember, I'm just hitting the high topics related to population. There's so much more. We summarize in the appendices, we summarize the findings um, from the PSU, latest PSU population forecast, um, which talks about how um, by 2027 in Lane County, um, deaths will outpace births for the first time in, reco in recorded information. Um, and so if we actually didn't have people migrating into um, Lane County, we would actually not be growing by 2027, we would be losing people, losing numbers. Um, so there's a bunch of information in there that's pretty interesting. Um, job growth. Um, so we have been growing way faster, 3.1% um, over the monitoring period up to 2018, because that's the latest data we have right now for Eugene. Um, compared to the growth rate of 1.4%. Um, we added some information that we were able to get about the county um, related to COVID, but there is a big um, caveat in a lot of this that particularly around the job data, it's all pre-2020. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. And that's why we're monitoring, right? Um, these things, I mean, not because of COVID, but I mean, things happen. And so, um, so we should, the next monitoring report will probably have, we'll be able to see some trends in there. We'll have new jobs data. And the question will be, what does it mean, right? Because it will, it will have um, COVID's effects on it. Um, but Lane County has actually been adding, has added back a lot of the employment that we lost um, in 2020, which is really good. Um, so we had already, Lane County had already added 51% of the jobs lost at the beginning of the pandemic by mid 2021. 
Um, the most recent OED forecast for Lane County shows a slower projected growth rate for the next 10 years than our adopted forecast. So it's 0.8% instead of the 1.4% that we're using for 20 years. Um, but again, that's only a 10 year forecast. <clears throat> And we should be getting another one next year. So every time we get a new forecast, that will be in the annual report, and we'll be able to um, we'll be able to look at that. Um, that's more frequently than they have been doing before, but um, but they're starting to do that annually, which is great. Um, the mix of jobs, the type, the mix of the type of the jobs that we've seen um, has been generally consistent with what we forecasted. So. Um, I don't have the numbers in here right now, but I think it's like 55% of jobs of our new jobs would be commercial non retail and um, commercial retail would be like 25% I think I can't remember exactly the numbers we can look at it but they're, they're in the report. <laughs> and so you can look at those, um, but it's generally what we forecasted um, for the whole 20 year period for the new jobs is what we're seeing in 2018 for all jobs. Um, so that's good to know. Um, we're getting these funky little things here because these are the comments. So sorry about that. Um, the average annual wage in Lake County has risen to 9.7% over the monitoring period. Um, which is good news. It is less than we saw statewide. Statewide um, wages actually increased 13.2% over the same time period. Um, we also saw a decrease in the um, population in poverty to 17% um, down from 28%, which is amazing. Um, but we pulled in, we don't have a chart on this, but we pulled in data from this um, ALICE, which is the Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed Report that United Way did. So they looked at not just the federal poverty level, but what you would need by county for what they call a bare bones budget. So housing, not just housing and food, but housing, um, childcare, transportation, et cetera, and um, they found that there were 28% of Lane County households were actually above, um, in addition to the fed, those that were below the, um, making below the federal poverty level. So um, yeah, oh, good, that, that got some questions. I don't know. I don't know who was first. You, you want to do it now? Sue, why don't you go? And then Alexis, Alexis. You're muted, Sue. So curious about that statistic when I read it because it, it sort of conflicts with what it looks like on the street. Um, so I'm wondering what other sources of data there might be that would affect that in a different way. Right, yeah, and we'll, I mean, that is part of the challenge is that you're just looking at the federal poverty level and you're looking at Alice and Alice is from 2018. Um, we have census data from on income, median income that we'll talk about and cost burden that we'll talk about as well. Um, that could be some information that we should pull into the executive summary maybe instead of necessarily just focusing on um, the poverty information because the cost burden is, um, you know, spending, folks that spend 30% or more of their income on housing are considered housing cost burden. Um, and then we actually have a significant amount of renters. It's over half of our renters pay more than 50% of their income on housing. And so those are some statistics that maybe that's a great example of, you know, maybe we need to pull some more data in here because it's not, um, doesn't feel like it's showing the whole picture. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, and I, I was similarly curious about that data. And I was wondering if um, the Alice report from United Way, is there an older one available just so we could see differences between the growth or decline of uh, that measure compared to poverty? Uh, we just pulled the 2018, so I don't know, um, but we can look. Thank you. Thanks. So Heather, you want to keep going? Oh, wait, Phil's Let's, got a question. Yeah. Yeah, I guess maybe um, piggybacking on what Alexis just said, I was thinking the same thing about it's a little further down, when you talk about the percentage of students that uh, are eligible for free and reduced price lunches, and it's a 2017 stat, is do you have data about the trend on that? I mean, it might give a little better context that it's 54% in 2017, and it's gone up, which um, certainly it has. But just a question about that. Yeah, it's funny because we actually have 2012 data on that, but it's broken out by the jurisdictions. And then all I could find was the 2017 data that had compiled the jurisdictions. <laughs> so that's why I have a, um, a note in here to see if we can get um, the, the separate jurisdictions, the separate school districts, I should say. And, um, and then we can put both of that um, historical, we'll at least have 2012 and then whatever the most recent is for the two, two districts. And if I could ask one other follow-up question, which you mentioned uh, a minute ago about the 50% uh, stat about um, more than 50% you know, of renters are um, cost burdened or, well, maybe it's the other way around. It's 50% I don't know what the status of renters are, are paying a disproportionate share far beyond the 30% that is kind of the, you know, the metric we'd like to use for affordability or how much of your income you're spending on housing. It's more like 50%. Is there, does that account for, or is that skewed in any way by student housing? Because you can imagine that, you know, a lot of students are, they are paying a disproportionate share relative to their income for housing, but they may have, I don't know if it's, if, if student housing kind of skews that that stat somehow, that's just my yeah, question. yeah. And Elena, I think I had it wrong, right? It's fifty percent mm -hmm. is cost burden, and it's like thirty percent are severely cost burden, something like that. You can look, I but so. I think Elena talked about the student housing. Um, yeah, so it does include student housing, and it is probably skewed because of that. But we just note that in in our write up. In the append, yeah, I think in the appendix, maybe also in the snapshot, because we do a comparison to Oregon and we are worse off, um, I believe, than Oregon. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. Thank you. So I got, yeah. I sort of caught this when I was reading through it. 20%, 28% of Lane County households are in this. Um, uncomfortable zone where they're um, above the federal poverty level, uh, but they're still challenged. Um, it would be helpful, these partial percentages are, are sometimes confusing. So it'd be helpful maybe to append that with something that says uh, bringing X percent of the full total population um, in, in uh, is stressed. So it's 28% that's above the, the uh, federal poverty level, but I, I couldn't find exactly where the federal poverty level is. Is it 17% there? Yep, so it'd be 17 plus 28. Yeah. Um, and we did that, I think, in the, in the snapshot, but um, that's great feedback. If it, it's helpful to have that here, we can do that for sure. Okay, thanks. Because it's like 45 or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. And actually putting it together is almost more impactful too, because yeah. 45% is a lot. Um, also just pointing this out, so under income for more information, charts, data sources, blah, 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 see this section of the report, general or overarching metrics, 
um, jobs and then go to the appendix and see that same title, but the details about jobs. So if you're looking for some of that information, hopefully that's a breadcrumb. Um, demographics, we didn't have anything bolded here um, because like uh, Elena said um, it here that um, some of the demographics haven't changed that much, even the persons per household, um, which is one of our inputs um, into our UGB analysis, it went up to 2.27 in 2019, but, um, you know, did it really change, you know? Um, we did, we do have data, well, we have old data. We have 2000 and 2010 data about Eugene's um, race and ethnicity, but we really want the 2010 or the 2020 um, census data to come out with that information so we can update that data. So that will be, I think, really helpful for our demographic information, but I don't know when we're gonna get that information. So housing costs. Um, so over the monitoring period, the median household income increased 20%, but gross rent increased 32%. So there's a good example of um, great incomes went up, but housing costs went up more. Um, we, you may recall that you reviewed some charts that we had put together from the regional land information database, which is county, Lane County, um, and assessor data on housing sales. So we had housing sales, single family housing sales for Eugene. We had single family housing sales for Lane County cities. And then we had, um, Sales, single family housing sales by area in Eugene. And the feedback we got, which was awesome, was that um, we should try to have more than just single family. Um, we need to make sure that we have manufactured homes in the single family sales price, which we were pretty sure we didn't because we had an artificial um, floor that we were using. I can't remember what it was, but we were we had a, a minimum sales price that we were using in the charts. Um, and so we went back and we have tried really hard <laughs> to get the sales data to, um, to get median sales data um, out of the, the county data. And we've had a very difficult time not getting duplicates um, because of the way the data is in the system and the way that we have to pull it out. So Elena has been the un untangler of data related to this and we're just still working on it. And so what we did is we pulled in information from Redfin. Um, thankfully they had it available. Um, it, I think Zillow previously used to have more detailed information then they do readily available. So we used Redfin. Um, we, we wanted to use sales data that, um, the reason we were going with county data is because it was all sales, whereas the regional, the multiple the RMLS, regional multiple listing services is just sales that used a realtor. So we were trying to get all sales. Um, but it turns out to be pretty difficult. So unfortunately, you're going to see a big gap, what I feel like is a big gap um, because we don't have those charts in the report right now. Um, but if we can get them figured out um, before we go to planning commission, we will. We definitely wanna walk through those with you because they will have changed substantially from when you reviewed them before. So Alexis has a question. Yeah, uh, I was just curious if the median income in this statistic is also indexed for inflation the way that wages were? No. Okay. So the reason it's not is because um, we didn't do that with rent either, right? Like we didn't do, yeah. And so when you look at the charts, uh, I think the first time you guys saw a median family income chart, we had adjusted for inflation. 
but then we were comparing rent to income and we had to keep them in the same adjusted or not adjusted and they were not rent was not adjusted because we didn't have that information and so then it was confusing actually to have income in um, two different median family median household income adjusted and not adjusted in two different charts so that's one of the things you'll see in the memo about changes is that um, we changed it to not be adjusted. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Phil has a question. Yeah, I was hoping that um, Rick was going to be here this time and last time as well, because I his firm used to pull together awesome data uh, that and I don't know what you know, ledger domain they use to, to pull that together. Maybe Sue knows, I don't know. And there's times where I go to uh, briefings, uh, say from one of his uh, former colleagues, Zoe Schwartz, and she'll give presentations and it seems like really, you know, terrific longitudinal data. And I don't know where she's getting it from, but I wonder if, you know, if you're going to use Redfin, you know, maybe some of these other people and Sue might know of where you might, you know, what other source you might have for good trend data or something that's more current or whatever you might need. Yeah, I think at the last, the meeting where we did talk about this, um, Rick did have a lot to say, right? You know, and he was the one that, uh, if I recall correctly, actually there were a number of you, I think that were like, wait a minute, I don't think we're capturing manufactured homes and we really need a bit more data. And um, so yeah, I was I am hoping that um, we can talk some more to him about this as well. Um, but yeah, Sue, sorry. Sue, yeah, I'm I'm a little bit out of the loop on that, so I couldn't really respond, Philip. But I do think that the firm handles it differently now than it used to when Rick and John were at the helm. So um, I'm not sure that they manage the data in the same way. However, there's probably still a good resource there that could be relied upon. I'm just too far away from it to know right now. So we will, we will definitely follow up on that because we're a little bit pulling our hair out at this point. Um, so, so, and we, you know, we want to get this kind of solidified um, so that we can regularly run these charts. Um, and here's our cost burden data. Okay, I'm glad I forgot that we had put um, cost burden data in here. It's just under housing costs. So you could put that in a couple of places. It could be under housing costs or it could be under income. Um, so yeah, 56% of renters were cost burden. 30%, um, oh good, I got it right the second time. 30% of renters are severely cost burden means they're spending more than 50% of their income on housing costs. But that's, you know, is that the right place? You know, when you're looking at it, think about that. Are we, are we making the connections we need to? Um, this one's always an um, interesting one, vacancy rate. So um, the, the, this changed a little bit, right, Elena? It went down again in 2019. Yeah, it went down a pretty big bump in 2018 and then again and then kind of again in 2019. And I feel like when we looked at this, because we had 2017 data before, we were like, ooh, it's a little bit lower maybe than what the forecast was. And now it's now it's significantly lower. And um, we got this information from the housing consolidated plan that the city does to meet federal um, HUD requirements that a uh, um, healthy vacancy rate is about um, seven to eight percent of for a rental market and we're um, so we have planned for five and at least in 2019 we're seeing 3.6. Um, so we talk about the housing market being very tight um, and then, of course, there's more discussion about this, um, including just like anecdotally, we've heard that, right? And then you hear all of these stories. And then we, even when you see this, which arguably is one year ACS data, you're like, oh, yeah, 3.6%. I think that is what, you know, we're hearing that it's tight, so... So new housing, I'm not sure that I need to go over this too much because we just reviewed building permit data. Um, but the key things that we pulled out from that 
is that um, while the total number of housing units is on track to meet the total number of adopted need, um, the specific, there are certain specific types that um, really haven't, that really aren't on track to meet our projections because so much of the housing um, has been, 72% of the new housing has been multifamily. And of that, over 90% has been buildings with five or more dwellings. And so, um, you know, I have a note here that we're double checking the estimate about um, what percentage are potentially student housing oriented that we flagged as student housing oriented. But that seemed pretty important. Um, Heather, we also, oh yeah, sorry. Can I just ask a question about that because we, and we may come back to student housing, but it, I wondered whether the University of Oregon actually had um, numbers that they could share with you on a regular basis for um, students living outside of the on-campus campus run facilities? They don't want to. Um, yeah, they um, we get group quarters numbers across the city um, and they are not, they, you know, all, all types of group quarters. So those are just like, you know, dorms, fraternities, but like this here is private. Um, we're talking about private multifamily apartments that are near the university or are specifically marketed to students is how we, that's generally how we flag them as potentially student oriented. Um, and they do not, um, I think a lot of people want student data, like for, you know, for different types of planning, transportation planning, things like that, but um, they do not give out that data, so. Um, so it's so like the, as a university town that, that and, and as, as I went through later other parts of the report, I just kept stubbing my toe against, you know, what student, the student profile does to all of our statistics. And it would be um, maybe in a future iteration of this reporting process, it's too late to do it now, I think, but it almost pull out the student body completely if there's some way to do that. And that way we can kind of compare ourselves more to other towns and cities around Oregon and, and the US. But this big student population skews our income and the housing and you know sort of all sorts of you know median household size. There are all kinds of weird things that it does. And you know, there's a lot of other communities that are in the same situation. And so those that's why we tend, when we do compare ourselves to communities outside of Oregon, we tend to pick cities that have a college, right. And so it's it is more comparable in that way. And um, you know, students are a protected class. I mean, we we have we have to plan for students. Um, they are part of our population, they're in the population projection. Um, and you know, it's um, it's hard when it's it's hard to to tease them apart when you know you do look at some of these apartments that are just apartments. Um, they're not the some of the new ones are just apartments. They just happen to be within. I'm mean, not happen to be, but they are within walking distance to U of O. So are they primarily occupied by students? Maybe, probably, um, I hope so, because we want them walking to U of O, but, um, but I mean, when you just look at the structure, some of the things that we were seeing before where it was very, like the interior design of the unit was very geared towards individual people, singular student kind of living, um, some of the, the apartments are not like that anymore. So, um, so it, is, it is a hard one to tease out. And um, I think that this is an area that, um, and maybe this is one of the recommendations um, when we get into the UGB planning is to do some specific study around um, student housing. That, 
that could be a recommendation that comes out of this. We don't have one around that right now, but. Um, so when we talked about, you know, we, you, you all know, cause we just talked about this, that, um, not only are we seeing a lot of multifamily housing, but, um, we're seeing a lot of commercial and high density land develop where we're not seeing as much, we're seeing a slower pace of low density residential land developing and slower pace of single family housing. Um, so we do call that out. Um, we call out how much of the um, BLI that was rerun, the new BLI draft, you know, it's just a draft version, but how much of that is not annexed for the different land supplies. Not that annexation is a perfect um, indicator of whether or not it's served with utilities that it needs to annex, but it's the quickest thing we can do to do that analysis. And um, if we can get deeper information about how much of the supply is not even served, we will do that. Um, it could be something we do as part of the UGB analysis, but it is pretty interesting to see that um, for low density residential, um, we have 40% um, is unannexed of the, of the supply that we have. And then we have about 50% of the total residential land supply. So low density, medium density, high density um, is on lands over 5% slope. So we tried to put in some of that information to um, help with understanding what future development could look like and what constraints we might have happening. Um, this is another one we don't have a chart on, but um, there is a count that is done for active homeless individuals. And so um, I'm hearing what you're saying about putting a little bit more in the executive summary potentially about here's what a previous count was and here's what the count is now. So we can know, so we can have, um, we can see if there's been an increase or if it's about the same, which I think is the case. I remember one year there was an um, account of about 3,000. Um, so we might wanna add something like that in here, an earlier count for comparison. Um, along the same lines as we talked about with housing um, development that most of the incentives that have been um, housing efficiency measure incentives that have been used have been multifamily housing, have been for multifamily housing. One of our biggest incentives is the Crow Road was redesignating um, several hundred acres of, Crow, of the Crow Road area out west 11th. Um, to low density residential, 170 acres. And that area doesn't have utilities yet to annex. And so development hasn't been realized there. But I think once, once services get out there, um, then you'll, you know, that will probably change pretty quickly. Um, but that is a theme you'll see in here is serviceability of, um, of our land supply. Heather, can I ask you a question about the Crow Road area? Um, so it's um, been designated and has any of the land between the city limit somewhere out there past Bertelson um, going out to Crow Road, has any of that also been brought in or is going to be brought in under this program? So this area is south of 11th. Um, and so you know where the cemetery is on okay. West 11th out there? Yeah, so it's mostly west of that. So south of 11th and west of that. And so um, I think there's only yes. one property right there that's pretty big that has been annexed. Um, but the, the majority of that area has not been annexed because it doesn't have utilities um, close enough to annex yet. So, okay, so um, <clears throat> is this correct or incorrect? The area with Wal uh, sorry, Target and Walmart, gas stations, all that 
is or is not in the city limits. It's in the city limits. And so it will be contiguous. There will be no hop, skipping, or jumping all the way out to Crow Road. Um, so, right, right, because this is way past that. Um, there's already land that has been annexed in between Target and um, Crow Road, like I was saying. There is some land that has been annexed. Um, this isn't about annexation. This is just about the designation of the property, but the annexation rules require that whatever land is being annexed, uh, it has to be contiguous to city limits. So that could be one property or that could be several properties together that string together that become contiguous with the city limits. Thank you yeah. for, I just really wanted to get crystal clear on that one. And yeah. Just as an aside, I know our rules are to keep the video on, but I'm gonna turn my video off while you're making a presentation because I must take uh, my poor dog home who's been sitting at my feet in my office since 7.30 a.m. <laughs> so he's hungry. So I'm gonna get in a car, but I'm listening. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you for letting us know. Okay. So I'm gonna try to, um, is this working for everyone to walk through like this and go through the comments? Okay, because I'm just um, was assuming we would give you time to read the port, report, but now I'm feeling like maybe this is actually helpful to do it this way. Um, so if it's not working for anyone, like Lisa's dog, <laughs> um, just let me know. So housing land, um, you know, we already talked about this a little bit. One of the things that we highlighted was that new housing has been overwhelmingly on flat land. So lots with, um, or land with less than 5% slope. So remember when we looked at the densities that we were seeing um, and we put in each of the land combinations, so plan designation, lot size, slope, we put the number of units that we were seeing um, to help figure out if you know there was real data there or not. Um, but actually, it was also really helpful in being able to summarize where development is happening. Um, and you will see that there is a map in there. Um, it's preliminary, but it does show um, where new housing has happened across the city. So that's in the report um, at the end of the housing development um, snapshot. And we will eventually have a link to that um, that you will be able to go to. Um, we talked about this, that a lot of the um, particularly low density and high density residential land, oh, we have a holding issue there, um, was coming in generally denser than the forecast. Um, but we added a note in the um, appendices as a reminder that we are, you know, these dense, this density um, methodology that we're using is different than we used before. Um, so I do think that the density is coming in higher because that's generally what we've seen over the years is a gradual increasing density. Um, I'm, I don't think that we can probably say, well, in 2012, the density was this, and now it's this. And so it's, it has for sure increased this percent. I mean, we did that in the tables, but I did put a note that like, you know, it's two different collection methods. So we need to be careful about that. Um, but this is the collection method we're using going forward. Um, and it's much more accurate than what we used before. Um, and so, you know, every time we do a report, looking back to at least this data will be a very good apples to apples comparison. Um, so employment development, um, kind of similar to housing, we saw a lot of employment development on developed land, more than we um, thought we would at this point in time. Um, 
we have a large lot industrial supply, which are um, basically vacant and partially vacant lots that are over 10 acres. Um, we expanded their urban growth boundary to accommodate that forecasted need for large lots. We had some already inside the UGB, but we had a forecasted need for more than that. Um, none of the large lots have been developed yet. Um, about half of the large lot industrial supply is in the expansion area, which does not have services yet. So there's no development happening out there. Um, like I mentioned earlier, overall incentives for employment development um, efficiency measures haven't really been um, used much to spur additional development for employment in the way that they have been used um, excuse me, for housing, particularly for multifamily. Um, and then updating the um, buildable land supply. Oh, sorry. Did you have a question? Does somebody have a question about that particular thing? Yeah, I do. Um, if you don't mind me jumping in, uh, Kevin. Okay. Um, okay, about the employment uh, incentives. And I, I, when I reviewed the memo that Elena had sent to us previously, if I'm not mistaken, that table, which I think is probably in the appendix that I didn't specifically look at, okay. But um, I think that you're including among these incentives, the urban renewal districts, right? And so this would, yeah, I count this one of the efficiency incentives and in development within these urban renewal districts. But insofar as I don't know, I mean, uh, maybe there's been some significant employment growth within these urban and rural districts, but it seems like a lot of what we're going to see uh, for sure in the riverfront and uh, maybe downtown urban and rural districts is um, more residential. So, I mean, is there any consideration for that or is it, you know, kind of reflected in the data in any way? Um, well, we have, we are tracking new um, and uh, let's see, for housing, we are tracking new housing that's happening using urban renewal incentives. That's in the chart, which has been none right now, but it, but we do, we did add a note to the report that said, um, but we know that development at the riverfront is going to change that. Um, so that's coming. Um, Separately, we can do an analysis, and I think we did do an, we did include a note in the appendix that there is there is some new housing that happened within the districts. So they didn't use urban renewal money, but they happened within the district, which feels important to track as well. Um, it's just not in the charts, um, but we do document that because there's a lot of leveraging that happens right just between development, um, spurring development in those areas. Yeah, I guess it's good to track that, in my opinion, you know, that that to separate out a little bit of development that occurs within these urban renewal districts may or may not have relied upon incentives. Good, if they didn't have to or didn't, um, it's available for something else that may need it. Um, and I guess one of the things I was thinking of too was like insofar as relative to employment, um, you know, we've we've seen in whatever recent years where say um, loss of employment or, or relocation of employment maybe that occurred, I'm thinking specifically of, of EWEP. Uh, so they developed their headquarters, operations moved out first and then administration moved out next. And insofar also as, um, you know, that there was no incentive for them to leave. There was no incentive for them to um, relocate and consolidate every all of their employment in this other place outside of the urban and rural district. The, just the, the kind of accounting for net job growth or decline within urban and rural districts, there may be some qualifying commentary that you make about that if you haven't already uh, elsewhere in the body of the, of the report. Yeah, we certainly haven't. Um, that's a great point. Um, it, the job stuff, I think I mentioned this the last time we talked about, you know, we, I thought um, housing data was difficult, but actually jobs data is more difficult, right? Because 
at least with housing data, we could go, we counted on this many new units coming through with MUPTI. Um, with jobs data, efficiency measures specifically, um, we have to do all this math in the background that was like, okay, we need this many jobs. Using the employees per acre density, you can fit this many jobs on, on, eight, on this many acres so far, very similar to housing. Um, but then when the building permit comes in, we don't get jobs data. We get building square footage and we get the acres that they're developing. So then when you're saying how much you're going to get with efficiency measures, for jobs, it's not actually jobs that we're counting, it's the acres developed from backing that math, like doing that math backwards. So, um, so that's, how, that's how the charts are, um, but yeah, that, uh, but we don't have a very good way to um, capture the job changes that happen because we're just tracking whether or not new development used the incentive and not if jobs moved around. We are, we are tracking total job numbers. And so we can see when jobs leave Eugene, um, but not if they move out of an area. You know, I've been thinking about this since our last meeting because, uh, and the difficulty you face, just as you're describing, only really, I, I think the only, um, time that those job numbers are actually counted are for um, enterprise zones. So I mean, if somebody gets a Benny from the state and they get some kind of deal and they have to, you know, they're saying, we're going to have a hundred new jobs. Great. They get these, these incentives, these Bennies, and they have to maintain that and they have to report back on it. But other than that, I don't know how you would track any of this. And insofar as trying to think of, okay, the things you're likely to hear, whether at the planning commission or the council or whatever Jamoki decides to appear uh, to give you the, your, their input, you're gonna be hearing from people that are gonna say, well, gee, you know, so much has changed about employment densities. <laughs> I mean, since COVID, oh my God, uh, how many people are not working in an office? So, I mean, you can't count for that right now. And you'll get questions about things like that, I know from, from people on these bodies. So anyway. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, in a way, I'm kind of glad that our jobs data is pre the COVID pandemic. Um, I do not envy our future selves <laughs> having to look at this the next time around, because um, I'll tell you what I just found out from the census, just to give you a little red flag warning, is usually when they do a decennial census, um, you know, there are certain things you can only really get from the decennial. Um, they still do a one year and a five year ACS um, for that year. So, so we should get 2020 ACS data. Well, I was just looking at their website and they're like, so we don't feel very good about the 2020 ACS data. So we're gonna release this like partial data and we're gonna call it 2020 experimental data. And, you know, like for some jurisdiction or for some geographies, and I was just like, oh boy. <laughs> so next year, future selves are going to have to decide um, what to do with that, because so much of our data is averages. And if we have a gap year, that is going to be very exciting. So I don't think we're going to have the same thing with employment, um, because they have been, OED has been you know, they report employment every quarter and that's still happening. But um, yeah, it's 2020 is going to continue to um, be something we're going to have to address in the future. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, so updated buildable land supply. Um, so we went through I don't know, I think it was like six meetings maybe where we walked through the methodology and that we were generally doing it the same way that we did it during the UGB analysis, knowing that it might change a little bit when we do the next UGB analysis um, because there are new state statutes. Um, 
There were some things we had to change because there were data layers no longer available or better data layers than we had last time, things like that. Um, so so um, you will see that there is a BLI, um, updated BLI summary that is long and detailed and um, gives all of that information um, at the end of the appendices. And then there is a snapshot summary of it that is in um, that is in the end of the report. And so, using the uh, the what we're calling the 2021 BLI rerun and applying the densities, the new densities. So employment densities. Um, there's a table in the report, or sorry, in the appendices um, that has the new employment densities. Um, we basically look at certain sample sites across the city, and then we just looked at them again. So we looked at them in 2012, and we just looked at them again to see what the, um, the employees per acre was for those sites. And um, it, they were pretty much the same, actually. So, um, but we use the new employees per acre, and then we use the new density assumptions where we had enough data to actually update the density assumptions. And I go into more detail about that for you in the ETAC update memo that we'll be putting in the folder tomorrow because it is a I did change it a little bit from what we sent you a couple weeks ago. Um, there were a couple of densities that were um, that we had used the monitoring results for, and they were higher. Or I'm sorry, we had um, I had used I had not updated them because we didn't have enough data. Um, and they were on, they were sloped lots. Um, so they were over 5% slope and, you know, we, we just aren't, haven't been seeing a lot of development on them. So I didn't update those density assumptions. Well, when we put them in the land model to get a capacity estimate, um, what we realized was that the old, the adopted density assumptions on those sloped land categories was higher than the monitoring results density assumptions on flatland. And that did not feel right. Um, so what we did is we just, and again, this is all going to get revisited at the UGB analysis, right? Um, because hopefully we'll have more data then as well. Um, but what we did was we just, I just used the same density assumption we were using for flatland, we used it on um, sloped land because it was actually it actually was lower <laughs> than what the adopted assumption was for sloped land. So it just did not feel right, especially when we really we haven't seen any density or you know we haven't really seen a lot of housing on sloped land to say that um, to say what the density should be. So Anyway, it will make more sense when you read the, um, the ETAC updates table. Um, I kind of walk through the steps that I did and highlight cells and all that good stuff for you. So roughly, um, we have capacity for about 12,000 homes on vacant and partially vacant land and for about 18,700 jobs on vacant um, and partially vacant employment land. Um, there's lots of caveats with this because um, this, that's it. That's all we did, right? We didn't go through the whole UGB analysis that happens in the land model. Will you say, where you say, well, some of that vacant land is going to be needed for parks and some of that land is going to be needed for a new e-web water tower or whatever it is. Um, that takes away capacity. And that, that stuff all happens when we do the UGB analysis. So this is just the high level monitoring snapshot of um, just to get a kind of estimate of where things lie, but this will all change. And so, you know, I wanna make sure that we have caveated that enough in here. Um, so I'll be curious to see when you read through this, if you 
um, if you all feel like we've done a good job with that. We also included, again, here's some high level bullet points about with the BLI rerun, how much of the developable land is unannexed um, in both residential and employment, well, industrial. Um, and then how much of it is 5% or greater slope, and then how much of it is actually less than five acres in size. Um, and we split it up by the acres of the supply versus the capacity. So 50% of the residential supply is on 5% or greater slope, but, but not only, but 43, per, which, it, which is 43% of the capacity. Um, because it is, you know, it's not exactly the same to say, you know, it kind of depends on what you're looking for. Are you looking for acres? Or are you looking for number of units? So that is new information for you. Um, I think we talked about having that information, but it's in there now. Um, and then, you know, taking that snapshot of if we take the BLI, the rerun BLI, and the preliminary estimate of capacity on vacant and partially vacant land, and then we take the demand for, where is that? Oh, did we dilute the demand out of there? I think I did. Um, oh, no, sorry, here it is. Um, so we have a supply for 12,000 homes and 18,000 jobs. We have demand for 15, again, 15,700 homes. That ha that's almost what we're planning for now, but for the next 20 years, we have basically the same demand again, based on the most recent PSU forecast, and then 24,000 new jobs which this will go up because this is just covered jobs. We actually need to plan for uncovered jobs. So not covered by employment insurance. Um, and we caveat that, but um, again, just to give us a high level estimate, the putting those things together, we come up with um, right now as a quote unquote today, a shortage of land for housing, particularly for medium and high density residential land and for jobs, particularly commercial. So that's new information for you as well. Um, it's all based on data you've looked at, but again, it's kind of pulling the data together um, and seeing if they're, you know, seeing, trying to help us know if there is an issue. So recommendations. Um, one of the things, um, as we've talked about, we now have a state mandate for um, doing a new housing capacity analysis by um, having it adopted actually by December 31st of 2026. And so one of the recommendations is to consider whether or not we should look at all lands and not just look at housing lands because that's the only thing we have the state mandated deadline for. Um, for housing, if you all have heard about the new draft housing implementation pipeline, which is kind of an overarching housing plan for the city, um, it has two and five year goals related to um, housing supply, so supporting that work. And actually the housing implementation plan or pipeline plan document includes some monitoring data into in it. So we're dovetailing our work there. Um, also recommend monitoring the implement, you know, the results of implementing House Bill 2001. Um, we might need to look at how we, you know, the housing types that we're monitoring and if we need to break things out a little bit more than we have in the past. Continue monitoring the effectiveness of our housing efficiency measures um, to determine whether or not they'll meet their forecast. Um, I'd love to say like for how long we need to keep monitoring them, but <laughs> that's pretty hard to say right now. So, um, so we don't, we don't have a, a date or like for the next couple of years, but um, you know, I think that's just something we continue to monitor. 
can watch like on average, are we trending to be able to meet the forecasted needs or not? Um, especially once like with low density residential, once the Crow Road area gets served, is that gonna change things? Um, as part of the next UGB analysis, um, consider looking at new housing efficiency measures that are focused on households with low to moderate incomes. Employment, um, we talk about this in housing too, I kind of skipped over it, but that infrastructure in issue, um, planning for infrastructure to areas that aren't served. Um, monitoring the effectiveness of employment efficiency measures. Um, and as part of the next UGB analysis, explore if employment is still growing and if the need for employment land is also growing or if less land is needed based on market changes. So this is one of those things of like pulling the two data pieces together and probably more than we have here. But, um, you know, we talked about how um, employment land is not being developed um, at the rate that we forecasted. But when you look at job growth, job growth, we are seeing job growth, at least through 2018, even with job, even in job sectors that typically need brick and mortar. And so, um, so is there a problem or are things changing, right? Because we're not, yeah. So anyway, that those are things that we're trying to put together that we might just not have enough information on. And then like um, Phil, you were pointing out and we've talked about, um, you know, with all the working from home that's happening now, how much of that is going to be a long, you know, a long-term trend and how much of it is happening right now is going to be kind of hard to say. But um, so that's why this particular one is a little bit vague, but it's also like acknowledging that this is this is a conundrum. And the other area that we talked about this, and I think, well, two areas even before the pandemic are retail. Um, you know, there's been a general trend of right of more retail online. And um, so are we going to start seeing um, still have still having retail jobs, but not them not needing to develop more land? Like, is that going to be a thing or um, an industrial? Similarly, you know, you hear about industrial employees per acre going down eventually um, because as industries um, automate more, they need less employees. Um, and so are we going to start to see those trends and will that end up having an effect on land, land that is converted, you know, compared to what we forecasted. So it's just we're kind of in one of those times right now that it's hard to tell um, what's going on. Howard has a question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, the recommendations are, are are fine as far as they go, but I guess I was expecting uh, when you talk about monitoring uh, a little bit more discussion about exactly what that means. Or, or is that a continual uh, monitoring, or are you looking at uh, you know on some of these uh, quarterly, annual um, uh, updates, and uh, you know what? How is this information going to be conveyed? Because it seems to me you're just saying monitoring, but it doesn't really give me, I guess, the information I was hoping for on the recommendation as to how that would be conveyed, especially since this report is going to council and there's um, you know, obviously a lot of um, policy implications in, in this. Um, you know, what what as part of the recommendations, what data are going to be provided uh, to them and, you know, what are the, the frequency of updates uh, uh, so that we can, they and the public, um, we the public can understand a little bit of what the trends are. Um, uh, yeah, so take a look when we talk about the monitoring process in the report and then also in the appendix and see, because we, we do talk about annual annual reporting, which you were required to do through the comprehensive plan, there's policy about it. 
Um, and then we're supposed to do a comprehensive report every five years or as needed, which is what this is. And so when we first looked at um, when the very first growth monitoring meeting that we had with you, uh, with the ETAC, um, I had, I think, two versions. I had a comprehensive report mock-up and an annual report mock-up or something like that, or maybe it was the data, I don't know, but I had two different versions just recognizing that annual reports are gonna be key data um, and then comprehensive reports are gonna be like this where there's just a ton of information. And so um, I think if efficiency measures feel like annual data. Um, and so maybe we need to call that out here that um, this is information that will be included in the annual report. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Or what you're well, yeah, I for? guess in the recommendations, I was just, um, you know, when you say monitoring, I guess I was just, uh, since this is kind of a summary, um, it'd be good to summarize uh, the frequency of, of monitoring and updates. I, I just think it would be helpful to the reader rather than having to go plow back through and find uh, yeah. you know, what that is. Sure. Yeah. So, the, I mean, that's exactly the kind of feedback that um, that I'd love to get. Um, you know, I do, I don't want to say that these are ready to go. Um, you know, because I think we need to go we need to go through the whole report and see what more needs to be added here. So, so Sue's got a question. Comment? Yeah, I have a comment. Um, I. I guess uh, I, I viewed this and thought that it seems like exactly what we were looking for in the TRG. Um, it looks like the right kind of framework for laying out all the information, laying out the details, laying out the data, and letting the policymakers draw their conclusions and make policy from it. So to me, it looked like the skeleton framework that we were exactly looking for um, five, seven, eight years ago. It's, you know, it's really easy and tempting, I think, to try to make our own conclusions about it and to say what we think, why we think this is happening. But it's so early. I mean, it's so early in the data collection process and um, we, we just haven't done this for long enough to really, I think, draw the conclusions that ultimately will be drawn. So I guess from my own perspective, and I don't know, maybe Ed can weigh in on this, and if Rick were here, he could weigh in on it, but um, to me, this is what I was looking for. It's the framework that I think we need to go forward, and it, it doesn't provide all the answers. Um, hopefully those answers will come over time, uh, but I don't think we can expect to have the answers yet. Yeah, and if there's, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, if there's more opportunity to put things like that in here, um, that it's helpful to explain why things are a little bit vague um, that, you know, and let's definitely want to hear those suggestions. Heather, will there be a, um, maybe it's in the planning director's introduction, sort of for the layperson who just picks this up, you know, you have been swimming deep, you and Elena and the other staff in this, and we've been swimming in these waters. Uh, some of us, like Sue and Ed, for years and years. Um, but somebody just picking up this thing, you know, it's like, well, what is um, growth monitoring? I was expecting a little bit um, at, at the introductory level, some language about, well, why are we doing this? And uh, how will it be useful? And um, what is it not to kind of underscore what Sue was just kind of pointing out that this is not, we're not making policy recommendations. We're, we're observing, we're bringing information to the policymakers. Did you have a chance to look at the introduction and how to use this report? Yeah, so I was wondering why it was okay. kind of buried in the document there. That yeah, so uh, it's like, 
um, table of contents too was like way down at page 15 or something. Seemed a little. Yep. Yeah. So we, um, that is a style <laughs> um, to have the executive summary um, and recommendations up front. Um, which is a little bit hard with this because it's not like those are just one page, like they're pretty lengthy. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's great feedback if that, you know, I'd um, love to hear from the group about if that doesn't work for you. Um, but yeah, definitely um, the planning director note will be much, you know, it will be kind of a little bit of the why we're doing this, um, where it came from, um, in a little bit more, hopefully user-friendly language than um, the introduction piece. But I think, um, I think, it, yeah, it sounds like you've already looked at that. But if there's things in there again that we have left out, um, that or that we could make more clear about what this is and isn't, then um, that feedback is welcome. Yeah, I mean, you know much better, at least, and maybe I'm um, just ignorant of kind of who the audience is, because obviously um, city council members and, and planning commission members, I imagine would be the primary audience, but to what extent do you expect just interested people in the community to want to pick this up and get engaged? I, I don't really know. Yeah, I mean, I think that is why we tried to do that onion approach where it's um, and and Alyssa's intro will talk about that. Like, um, and I think I can't remember. I guess it's in the how to use this report um, where we also talk about the different layers, you know, that. Um, but again, this is later in the document. So you have to have gotten past the Yeah, so it's good feedback. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that is the hope is that um, somebody would want to read the executive summary that hasn't been involved and that it will be accessible and interesting and um, in the recommendations and that they won't feel like they have to go any further if, they did, if they're not interested in it. Um, and so hopefully, you know, Alyssa is going to... Um, you know, be engaging in her drawing people in with her welcome, um, well, welcome introduction and kind of why we're doing this and where it came from, but in a, in a less report manner. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I like, I like the structure of, of your onion. Um, but I just think that the, the skin, um, the like, wrapping. Yeah, it could be a little friendlier to uh, the uninitiated. I will pass that on. <laughs> and 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 actually, um, I mean, that's good to let her know. But if there are things we can do with the executive summary that feels like it is too wonky or it's not accessible, um, let's, you know, let's get that. Let's talk about that. Um, Jennifer and then Phil. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I actually hadn't thought of that, but now that we had this short discussion, I actually really agree with that the executive summary having it just go right into data with the population and all that stuff is a little jarring and maybe having just, just even a little bit of why, we, why are you even here and why should you care? Once, I mean, I actually found myself reading the report and I had to stop myself because I'm like, I do not need to read all of this today or, or when I was doing it, but it was very easy to read. And it just kind of like encouraged me to keep going as I was reading it um, in a way that many city documents do not. And I have to force myself to read them. So I, I really like the way it was written. Um, but I do agree we need that for some folks who might just end up there and are not sure if they want to keep going, that that little bit is, would be very helpful. Thanks, Phil. Um, just mechanics. I mean, since I've I've started on my own, kind of doing a little um, whatever uh, track changes kind of thing with you know things I've highlighted or comments or you know suggested edits or whatever. 
when and how do you want that from us? I mean, just sometime between now and our next meeting or next week or, you know, what's the, what's the timeline for our homework? Yeah, so maybe this is a good opportunity to go back to um, or talk about a little bit about next steps, um, if that works for everyone, and then hopefully Phil will touch on what you're getting at. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. So um, next steps are that we've got the next two meetings um, in December scheduled, the second and the uh, 18th, I think. Um, yeah, uh, 16th. Um, and because, um, oh, thank you, Councilor Yeh. Um, because we didn't get the report to you um, in time to, um, although this has been a great conversation, I must say, um, but for folks to have really um, dove into the report, um, we are anticipating meeting on, at least on January 6th. And um, I don't know you know, how if folks feel like, um, you know, we're moving into the holidays, so I don't feel like we can probably schedule another meeting in between these times. Um, but what's gonna happen is that we won't really probably go till pl to planning commission until um, the end of February um, at this rate. And so, you know, I know everyone's got Zoom fatigue um, and we're moving into the holidays. And so you're, I'm guessing maybe some people's bandwidths might be challenged by other things coming up. And so um, we did want to float the idea of whether or not we should extend any meetings or we could see how the meeting on the second goes and how quickly we go through it. And if we're pretty bogged down, then we can kind of reassess um, at the end of that meeting and decide if we think we need to extend the meeting on the 16th and the 6th. Um, I just really don't know how quickly we're going to be able to go through this. Um, and then, of course, after that, we're going to need to edit the document before it can go to planning commission. And then there's quite a bit of lead time to have the document done before it can before the planning commission meeting. So that's why we part of the reason we have a big gap. Um, so as far as you know, editing, track changes, clarification kind of things, um, they're not substantive. I think you can email that to us. Um, you might, I might suggest emailing it either, you can either wait and send us the whole document after you've reviewed the whole thing for that, that would be fine. You could send us the sections after we've done that topic area, it, um, either one of those I think would be fine. It's gonna be hard, you know, it's gonna, I mean, depending on what your capacity is um, for us to get through all of that, but we definitely wanna hear from you. So whatever works for you um, to get us the information is great. But if it's substantive stuff, we, of course, we really wanna have the conversation with the whole group. So I have a question to the whole group is, I mean, Heather kind of read the document to us I and mean, he went sort of paragraph by paragraph. Um, and if we try to do 250 pages of that, um, I think we'll all go cross-eyed. So I'm wondering if there's an abbreviated way to do this, if people can take notes as they read it and, instead of actually kind of reading the substance in the document, we go section by section and um, we could, you know, we provide comments, feedback, questions about it. Um, I don't know if that would be better, but I'm just wondering if that would be more efficient. 
Yeah, I certainly, I'm just going to jump in. I certainly was not planning on reading you all the document. I already feel like I'm losing my voice <laughs> and I don't think you want to listen to me. Um, but I do, I would suggest that as well, if that works for folks as we kind of take chunks of topic areas and just kind of generally ask the group, does anyone have any um, substantive comments on this section? And then we can take a, you know, we can see how many hands are raised and then just kind of walk through them topic by topic. But um, that does mean that like, as I was saying in the beginning, you know, the next, we'll just march through those areas, um, march through the topics like we outlined in the memo. And so folks will need to be ready for us to keep going, you know, if one topic goes quicker than another topic. Yeah, it, it, it suggests that we need to do our homework um, kind of thoroughly, but otherwise we'll be wading through this material through next, through Easter. <laughs> I don't think any of us want that. And I think so. I I think do we need to have there like you and me and maybe Kevin and Tiffany talk about what the next homework assignment is because it it isn't broken out like it's numbered right now one two three four five like we're not two doesn't mean one meeting. So the homework might be sections two, three, and four. Um, and I don't think we've quite figured out what that what the next meeting is yet, but. Um, so in the overview memo, right, we have, so we went, we overviewed um, the executive summary and the recommendations. Um, I think at the next meeting, we would, we, the order is listed on the left. So we would go through um, the introduction, the collection system, um, and then I think we should be ready to go through the general, um, the general metrics because I think that there might not be very much on um, the introduction and the collection system that's actually substantive. You can certainly, we've talked about some of those sections already, um, and you can certainly give me those comments, um, give us those comments in track changes or in the documents, send those to us. Um, but substantive, those are kind of overview things. So. Um, it feels like, you know, getting through the general, the general information is going to be. Yeah, at would, minimum, what we're going to need to go through. Yeah, it'd be good to sort of challenge us to read a little bit beyond in case we have the capacity to move through the material quickly, um, rather than kind of stalling early and then not making progress. Let's use our time efficiently. So maybe we say, yeah, um, on, the, on the memorandum, it's the introduction, the overview of collection system, um, general metrics, and then you had revisit executive summary. But only for that particular um, discussion, yeah. Those particular topic areas, yeah. Population, jobs, demographics, and census. Um, and that's probably enough, unless you think we ought to go on to housing development metrics, because that is kind of the big one of the big topics. What are people feeling as far as their capacity? Maybe that's um, <laughs> maybe that's a good way to um, get a sense from the group about how how much time you have. Because um, the second is not very far away, um, but on the other hand, it's two two weeks, but it's Thanksgiving week next week. Right, that's right. 
I certainly don't want anybody using my name in vain over Thanksgiving because you're reading 200 pages. Lisa? Thank you. Um, yeah, in terms of capacity, I, I think it does get hard in December and I know I, I will most likely not be able to join the December 2nd meeting and, and it's a lot of family weddings and you know things happening. So I just want to throw in my semi-availability. So maybe let's just shoot for two, two, two and three on the memo. Okay. So this, and I'll send out an email too. That work with everybody? Okay, great. Um, I think that was it. I didn't have anything else. That was the last slide, which I'm not going to show you. Was just going over that timeline. So. Okay, well, it's 7.31, so we did pretty well. Thanks, Sorry everybody. we didn't get out early. <laughs> No, no. Well, I wish everybody had wonderful Thanksgiving. And um, enjoyable reading. Thanks, everyone. Reading. See you in a few weeks. Thank you. all You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to a, a special note of appreciation for the staff, Heather. I don't know who puts the slideshow together, but you know, you've you've you got to do the report and then you put a slideshow together for us. So thank you for that. That really, it helps. Oh, good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> extra work. Thank All you. All right. Good night, everyone. Have a good holiday.